Welcome to the Texas Conflict Coach radio program. If you've ever experienced or engaged in destructive or unresolved conflict, then you know it leads to broken relationships, distrust, and damaging results. Our program will help you manage and resolve conflict effectively with strategies, valuable resources, and support. Since 2009, our radio program hosted guest experts from around the globe sharing their perspectives, experiences, and expertise while giving you food for thought. If you can't listen live, then download and listen to any of our 300-plus podcasts in our library at TexasConflictCoach.com. So sit back, relax, or join the conversation every Tuesday evening, or tweet us at TX Conflict Coach. You know, someone makes an inappropriate comment. It might be a racist or a sexist joke. You feel uncomfortable and hope that someone else will speak up. But everyone hopes that someone else will speak up, not us. It's uncomfortable silence will fall. And in this episode, as part of our Workplace Bullying Harassment Series, we will specifically talk about workplace witnesses, how bystanders can become essential allies in tense situations, with my guest, Dr. Maureen Scully. She and I will discuss what does it take for active bystanders to speak up. And when they do so, they can often avert brewing conflict. You will learn how you and others can become active bystanders through awareness and practice. Now, again, my guest, Dr. Maureen Scully, is a professor of management and is currently the interim dean at the College of Management at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. She coined the term tempered radicals with Deborah Meyerson to study, show how change agents inside the workplace take actions that push boundaries and make a difference. She conducts training workshops on how to be an active bystander, not only in universities, businesses, nonprofits, and everyday life. Maureen is the co-author of a textbook widely used in MBA programs called Managing for the Future, Organizational Behavior and Processes, now in its third edition, and a co-editor of a volume on gendered approaches to work and change called Reader in Gender, Work and Organization. Now tonight we are taking live callers, so if you are listening on your computer, you can also call 347 324 3591. Press number one if you would like to speak with us. We also have the chat room open. If you'd like to post there, simply go to www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash Texas dash conflict dash coach. If you're already there, just scroll down the page. You'll see that the chat room is open. We're taking your questions and comments there. So Maureen, welcome to our program. Thank you so much, Patty. I really appreciate your having me as part of your series on workplace bullying and harassment issues. I think it's great that you're doing this. Well, let me tell you, there's been a buzz around this particular episode because people are very interested on, especially the bystander, and there's these myths and under, misunderstandings, and they're like, oh, my gosh, I've witnessed these things. What do I do? And uh, so there's been a lot of buzz and a lot of excitement. Um, but what I want to kind of kick off with is, what motivated you to do the research and work regarding the internal change needed in most organizations? And because we, you talk a lot about that in some of the work that you do. So what's motivating you to do that? So, Patty, I'll paint the big picture and then I'll zoom into bystanders and change agents. So I study meritocracy. Meritocracy is the idea that people, especially in the United States, but we think about this globally now, can get ahead at work if you apply your merits, that you can get ahead on the basis of your merits. This is a really important deep value in the United States. We see it celebrated in Horatio Alger's stories about getting ahead. But the question is, and this is my puzzle, like I'm really interested what people believe about meritocracy. Is it really working? If it is, it's great. It's kind of a high ideal, ideal to aspire to. But if we don't have meritocracy, well, then what's wrong? So I look at the impediments that might hold some people back, might sideline people, undermine them at work, basically keep their talents from being seen. Um, if we don't have a meritocracy, then we have to worry a bit about how do we remedy inequality? How can we make the playing field level? How can we make the workplace fair? I really liked what your guest last week, Laura Lee Keishley, said the workplace is 
where we spend our time, our waking hours, where we meet a really wide range of diverse other folks, and I would add where we earn our livelihoods. We want to have the opportunity to be recognized. So that's the big picture. Zooming in, I'm really interested in what can everyday folks do at work? You know, not just our big, you know, leaders of social justice causes, but everyday folks at work um, through being what Deborah and I have called tempered radicals, people who Rock the boat a little, not so much that they fall out, but try to make some change from where they sit. Um, or the bystander, that's a particular um, kind of ally that I'm, I'm interested in. Um, how do bystanders make a difference? And I care that they make a difference because what's at stake is big. It's the, the whole, to me, equal opportunity structure is at stake here. And if bystanders can make sure that people are seen, whatever their race or gender or cultural background or identity, um, well, that's really, really important on the ground work. So let's clarify for listeners what you mean by bystanders. It's a great question because when I ask people this in training workshops, they usually come up with adjectives before bystander, like the passive bystander, the apathetic bystander. So what my colleagues and I who work on bystander awareness are trying to do is say, well, who's the active bystander? So for me, the active bystander is someone who witnesses or observes or notices something that goes wrong at work, and it's a deviation from something we value. Like we say we value inclusivity. Well, do we? Um, the bystander witnesses something and takes some kind of positive action, maybe small, that resets the situation or pivots the situation, um, shows people that they have an ally. You know, and we're going to break this down, but I imagine that people who are listening to this and say, well, I witness things, but there's no way I'm going <laughs> to do anything. They might be uh, having some fear and anxiety right now, but that's what we're here to talk about is how, you know, how can you as a witness or bystander become an ally, even if it's, like you said, some small positive action to kind of change things. So why don't you set the tone by telling us a little typical presenting uh, situation in the workplace that involves a bystander. Okay, and I'm glad you asked for a situation because in the training we do it a lot through stories and examples. Over the years I've been connecting, ex collecting examples from my students at University of Massachusetts Boston where I teach. We have a very diverse group of students who've experienced lots of things in the workplace and workshops that I've taught. So I love to do it through stories. So here's a story that uh, um, we've mulled over in workshops. What would you do? So here's the situation. Um, there's a young man named Jose and he's been listening to his mentor's advice. His mentor says, go network when you're at work. So here is Jose at the company holiday party, and he sees a table over the way with about four people huddled around. He recognizes a couple of them as colleagues, and they're talking to the regional vice, regional vice president, so this is his big chance. So he summons his courage, he walks over, he says hello, and the vice president says, oh, great, thanks, I'll take another white wine. Mm. So, mm -hmm. you, right? Mm, yes, yeah, I'm, always, I'm out, already right, like, Patty? Mm, ouch, exactly, because no. I'm thinking he's making an assumption already, but I might be getting into your story, so go ahead. No, nope, you're telling that it's the perfect moment in the story. So what's happened there maybe is a moment of unconscious bias. Um, but what I find when I'm teaching about bystander awareness, instead of banging the hammer for, you know, don't fall into the trap of unconscious bias, well, people will. Um, this vice president has unconsciously assumed that, Jose as a Hispanic man in a nice black suit with a white shirt who walks up to the table might be the waiter. And when we all went, <gasps> ouch, we realized that Jose is being undermined. So when Jose, a pseudonym for the person who told me this real life story, because I like to say these are real things, not, oh, this would never happen today and in this age. When Jose told the story, what stunned him wasn't that the vice president had mistaken him for a waiter, but that silence fell. And his two colleagues, the guys he knew, didn't say anything, didn't set the record straight. Mm. That's the uncomfortable moment. So, so they were witnessing this but didn't say anything. And just like you just said, probably a lot of listeners are saying, well, of course they didn't. They value their job. This is a person with power. Um, yeah. Why would I wade into the middle of it? Maybe I'll make it worse. Maybe I'll actually embarrass Jose if I say something. I can't think of what to say. We have many, many, many reasons why we wouldn't do something. In situations like this, we often freeze. 
But the other thing I tell people in situations like this is we remember them later, not just because later we think of a great thing to say, but because we feel bad. We wish we would have said something. Almost always in a workshop I can get people to recall a time they wish they'd spoken up. Um, some of what we go on to do in talking about a scenario like this is think of some things that uh, those two colleagues or friends could have said. Um, and I like to remind everyone why this is so important, and I actually appeal to the words of Martin Luther King Jr. in this instance. He said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Hmm. I like that. I like that very much. And, now, now, so I'm curious, in, in this example that you've just given, um, and, and, of course, we're the Texas Conflict Coach, we're always talking about conflict. It doesn't sound like there was necessarily conflict that, account, that took place in this situation. That's right. And even the word enemies is strong. There was hurt. There was something possibly offensive, but not actual conflict. Although it's conflictual in that Jose may be feeling, gee, I just don't fit here. Um, my colleague Mary Rowe at MIT, who's in the Ombuds office there, has really pioneered our thinking about why active bystanders matter. And she says in exit interviews, we often discover that someone's leaving because, eh, not because some vice president or other person told a racist joke, said an inappropriate thing, but because no one else said anything. I felt so alone, I was out on a limb. And Organizations are very quick to assert these days that they're trying to attract and retain a diverse group of employees. Um, the young Hispanic consumer marketplace is a very important place for businesses today. So we want to keep Jose in this organization. So it's not actually conflict maybe and it's not overt. It's uncomfortable, it's cumulative, and it matters. So in this situation, I think there's a lot of myths and maybe some assumptions that we make. As you said earlier in your trainings, you will ask, you know, what is a bystander? People automatically put these adjectives of, you know, apathetic and passive and do nothing and we're just watching and observing. And um, so those, are, it sounds like, might be some myths or assumptions. And you said in this story scenario that we freeze, we fall, fall silent, you know, we begin to feel bad. So what is it that you want to tell listeners about breaking this myth based on your research, based on Mary Rowe and MIT's work? What is it you want listeners to know is, is not a myth? It is certainly true that it's natural for us to freeze, to feel some uncertainty, and to engage in what social psychologists call diffusion of responsibility. It's what you opened with, that hope that surely someone else will speak up. So one thing that matters is practice. Um, think of CPR training, cardiopulmonary rescue uh, training, where you practice on a dummy, when no one's actually having a cardiac event where it's not life or death. And you practice and practice and practice and practice in a day-long CPR training workshop until you feel pretty comfortable that you're ready. You, you've, you've got that script. You've got something to do. So a lot of what we do is practice in these kind of low-stakes settings. We use some real scenarios like this, and we role play. And we try out different things that people could say. So a few things that folks have come up with in discussing this scenario is someone could say, oh, I could use some more white wine too. Let's find a waiter. Or um, in, instead of um, you know, playing with the sort of the wine assumption, notice what you shouldn't say is, I can't believe you just made that unconscious, stereotypical assumption. Um, you, know, you don't have to embarrass anyone. You don't have to try to save face. I do think people in power, like that vice president, have some obligation to be a little bit more alert. But it's happened. So you're trying to pivot the situation. You could say, oh, hey, yeah, some more wine's a good idea. I can get a glass. But first, have you met Jose? He's a really key player in our Northeast account strategy. So you turn it around to what? my colleague Mary Rowe has called a micro-affirmation. So instead of saying <laughs> the inequity or the problem, you use it right. as a moment to praise and introduce Jose, and that can kind of move it right along for everybody. You're just trying to pivot. You're just trying to stop the thinking silence. So um, I don't know why this is coming up for me when you said that. You know, this is a very organic show, but I... <laughs> When you said it stops their thinking, you know, to that micro affirmation. But do you ever watch Caesar Milan on TV? How he trains, you know, dogs and stuff. 
Have you ever seen that his well, show at all? I haven't, but I know of it. Yes. Oh, yeah. So Caesar Milan, he's he's great about behaviors, and uh, you know, if you're witnessing aggression, and you know, the 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 owners of these dogs uh, will you know will will freeze up, and they get anxious, or they're fearful, or they'll get aggressive, and they go the other direction, and then they're you know, then they they make the things worse. And he says, all you have to do is take this, just take your foot behind you when the dog is in this you know moment where it's not a pivotal he's you know he's in his thinking he's in his fear moment he's in his whatever that he's reacting to and just gently nudge your the back heel of your foot to the 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 hump you know, the haunches of the dog to change his thinking to snap of him just that pivotal slight movement to get him to snap out of it and get out of that fear moment so that you can appropriately uh, deal and manage with the situation. I don't know why that came up, but that is what I was thinking of. When you're thinking about these micro affirmations, these micro movements, you're not saying to bystanders as active bystanders that you have to do some big thing, certainly nothing destructive like embarrassing and using sarcasm, but you're not saying to be an active ally that you have to do this major thing that's going to take such risk for you. So I'm not hearing you say that. No, you're right. Patty, your example is spot on. I love it. I'm, I'm going to use it. I'll use it with attribution, but that's perfect <laughs> because it's about an interrupt, right? It's sometimes just a little nudge. Less is more. Stop things from escalating. Do something sooner than later because the longer the silence weighs, the harder it is. And sometimes it's physical because a lot of people will say to me, oh, I'm just not quick with the one-liners um, or English mm -hmm. is my second language. It's hard for me to think of what to say. So some things you can do might be with body language. Someone could stand up then as they say, oh, yeah, more wine. That sounds good. Um, stand up, turn, pivot, look at Jose and say, hey, great to see you. How are things in your account area? Um, so often a physical move helps. In fact, you're reminding me of a time when I was in a meeting and there was a discussion about admission standards for students. And um, I'm a white woman. And the conversation was around, well, maybe for some um, of our as students of other races, we could lower the admission standards a little bit, which is another myth. Um, often you need higher scores to get in um, when, you're, when you're from a non-dominant background. And an African-American woman colleague nudged me because it was more of an important moment for me to say something. I think the bystander as an ally is often an ally um, across race or gender. It's very hard to always be the person who's, um, say if you're a woman, making a point about gender. How great if a man speaks out? Um, or as a African-American person, how great if a white person says something about, hey, wait a minute, what's with that assumption about, you know, changing standards around race? Um, so it was that little nudge, because I was in my mind rehearsing the big speech that I was about to make as a sociologist mm. on standards and admission. The little thing was better. The little, hey, wait a minute, hey, ouch, ouch is a great thing to say. Um, ah. It often is just the little, little, little thing that um, punctures the awkward moment. So okay, very your example good. is spot on. Triggered a lot of thoughts for me too. <laughs> oh, well, excellent. Well, let me tell listeners that they are you are tuned into the Texas Conflict Coach Blog Talk Radio program. We're into our April series on workplace bullying harassment, and today we're talking with Maureen Scully from the University of Massachusetts in Boston, and specifically we're talking about workplace witness or, or how to be an active bystander, be an ally when you're witnessing certain situations. So we've talked about this example with Jose. In this case, could have been a, a racist remark, an unconscious bias or stereotype that, you know, that comes out and, and some examples of, you know, how could we, you know, interrupt and do a micro affirmation, a, a small way to uh, change the situation. But how does this connect? to workplace bullying. I mean, obviously, we witness workplace bullying, but how does it amp the bystander risk uh, to be more active? So let's talk about that. So in a bullying situation, we may need some other kinds of resources. Bystander interventions about things that you can do in the moment. Bullying is often more aggressive more intended and prospective and more repeated over multiple situations. So that might be a case where you need to find third parties, where you need to look at your organization's policies, where you need to make some intervention outside that 
little moment um, and actually um, appeal to somebody else in the organization, to an ombuds person or someone in HR or a supervisor. I'm not saying that bystander interventions fix everything. Sometimes they're right in the moment. And perhaps, since bullying is a pattern that escalates, if it's interrupted early enough, um, then a bystander can make a difference. But if you're further down the path in a negative pattern, uh, you might need to turn to other resources. So let's say this is early on, okay? And, mm -hmm. and, and early on could be the bystanders experiencing it for the first time early on. Maybe they're a new employee and this, it, it could be the supervisor. And we all, we all know from past shows that not all those who have been, uh, you know, saying using bullying behaviors always someone, uh, in a, you know, like a leadership position. It could be the secretary. It could be someone who is perceived power. So we, we know that. But if we're witnessing it for the first time or starting to recognize what is happening and that something needs to be said, what could a bystander, let's say it's a coworker, what could they do to support uh, their coworker who they perceive as being uh, in a bullying situation? Yes. Especially There's in that moment, could they do something? Yes. So sometimes what the bystander does, and this is certainly observed in playground dynamics, is as soon as the first bystander speaks up, the other people who were caught in the diffusion of responsibility trap feel free to speak up. That's what I sometimes call the second mm -hmm. order bystander. You just have to crack that door open for all the other good people who are around to be good too with you. Um, so sometimes just a little thing to say, oh, hey, wait a minute. Um, let's rethink this. Uh, sometimes just cracking that door open lets other bystanders come in. In fact, in the playground, you often want people to walk away. A bully often wants an audience. So it might be that, back to your idea of a physical move or turn or nudge, you just turn and walk away. Say, I don't have to listen to this, and others leave too. Or it could be that you say something like, ouch, like, ooh, ouch, really? Um, is that the best we can do here? And you respond to the comments, and then others may join you, um, not leaving you hopefully out on a limb. Sometimes mm. it can come from problem solving, too. Um, it can be a little bit more forceful than an ouch. So bullying could take the form of trying to exclude someone on the basis of a religious identity. So say you're working with a team. Again, this is based on a real example from a team of students. You're under a lot of pressure to get some work done. You want to have a meeting on Saturday. But you have a person in your group who is observant in their Jewish faith and would not want to work on a Saturday. And they're pressed, oh, come on, we're so overworked, just this once. Um, that's a kind of bullying if it, if it persists. And you could problem solve. Um, you, instead of trying to dive into the issue, say, well, you know, we, we could meet on Sunday afternoon. Well, I'm happy to stitch together my parts of the report by email on Friday, email them all around, and let's, you know, just kind of work offline. Let's, let's use a Google group and post our bits whenever any of us can come online. Um, Different ones of us may have different times of the weekend in which we have time for religion or family, and we'll regroup on Monday so we still get things done over the weekend, but out on our own time. Problem solving like that can sometimes help and say, well, let's get to the root of what this is. Maybe people are feeling fearful about work intensification, and the bullying looks like religious bullying, but maybe if we can solve the, the issues about getting work done over the weekend, we can steer around it a bit. Now, are there times where bystanders take it over the top? They go the other end of the compendium, the, the, the pendulum, if you will, from doing nothing to doing the nudges to just being overly zealous. Yes. Um, so you, you can overdo it. And I think actually the fear of overdoing it is what keeps a lot of people silent. Uh-oh, I'm going to get this wrong. That's why I keep saying less is more. Do it sooner than later, because the longer it goes, the more likely you are to make it big. Um, sometimes clumsy is okay if you do it fast. Um, and stay curious. Always be in an asking stance and use the I voice. Um, you know, I think people overdo it or escalate when they answer an unconscious bias with an unconscious bias. So, hey, we're going to have a meeting at 6 p.m. Oh, I just like you older guys to forget that some of us have families at home. Oops, we've just piled on a stereotype to trying to deal with the stereotyping situation. Um, so sometimes, well, a little bit quicker, a little bit faster, a little bit lighter touch, and stay curious. Well, 
I'm not so comfortable in the I voice, always good in conflict situations. I'm not so comfortable meeting at 6. I wonder if we could find another time. And then you're not heaping it on. Now, let's just clarify when you say I voice. I know we've talked about I statements uh, before in the past. Is that what you're referring to or are you referring to something else? So our listeners Exactly that. that. Now, yes, it's a, a general good practice in conflictual situations is to testify to the I experience or speak in the I voice. It's exactly that. Okay. So definitely you're not recommending that bystanders now become the strong advocate and they're making things worse and calling the person on the carpet or, you know, embarrassing them or using sarcasm or, you know, threatening their, you know, I'll go to blah, you know. So, I mean, I've certainly seen some people who can go in that direction, uh, but certainly uh, I, it, and we've seen that, you know, the escalation, the idea is to halt the escalation or, like you said, to change or pivot or turn it somehow to interrupt that. That's what ultimately you're asking of bystanders when you talk about being uh, more active allies. That's right. So to be concerned and curious, to facilitate, to be a humble questioner, to be a learner in the situation, and mm -hmm. not very much not to be the judge or avenger or rescuer or enforcer or fixer, not to be the final know-it-all. Now, in the earlier story with Jose at the table where this, you know, the, everyone kind of froze and the silence fell, and the, as you said, people then later reflect on it, they feel bad, and I guess, you know, maybe we even kind of leave it hanging, so what do you tell people then, they reflect and they're like, oh, I should have said something, I should have done something. Was there anything more to that story, since this was a real example, that happened? Uh, so what actually happened is that there was a moment of awkwardness and then the conversation just kind of went on, neither addressing the assumption or really properly quite introducing Jose and correcting the impression. But afterwards, the, one of the guys who already knew Jose said to him, oh, man, sorry, that was uncomfortable. I should have said something. That's okay. I, I actually think really a lot of what's at stake is that people know that they have some allies and be noticed at work. It's better in the moment um, in front of the person with power when the stakes are even higher. But um, if you don't, and we sometimes don't, we all freeze, um, I think speaking up to somebody afterwards and even saying, what would you have wanted me to do? I've sometimes um, mm -hmm. seen that when there's been a – joke that's a little on the edge and calling it out might actually embarrass the possible object of the joke, it's better to ask later, like, would you have wanted me to say something? What would you have wanted me to say? We can always be in a learning stance that way. I love that, and, and asking, you know, for, you know, permission or asking for feedback, you know, what would you have liked me to do to support you? Because what you're really talking about here as bystanders, as allies, is not just, I mean, it really applies to a lot of different situations, not just workplace bullying, but things that are either seem to be inappropriate or where there's assumptions, like you said, these unconscious bias or stereotypes that have been made around uh, gender, race, religion. So really, bystanders is not just directly linked to workplace bullying. So I think a lot of times people think of bystander, they um, automatically assume bullying situations. But really what you've covered is a lot of different situations where we are kind of bear witness and what can we do in the moment uh, to be more active and as an ally to the, the folks that we're witnessing these things about. That's right. It's not charging in and breaking up a fight. Um, if there's some conflict, it's whatever conflict there is when um, different groups or people don't have equal opportunity at work, which is where I opened up. So one might imagine afterwards actually going to the vice president and saying, did you notice what happened there, if you have that kind of working relationship or someone who wants mm -hmm. to learn, who might even say, yeah, I, I could tell something was amiss, but I didn't know what I'd said there. Um, so, you know, you can maybe be in a learning moment with that person, again, so that when it comes time for performance review, Jose is fully seen as the talented and contributing member of the team that he is, and not subtly undermined or made less of because people aren't really seeing him um, through the lens of he's a professional. Uh, so, you know, it's not like conflict, gloves, or, you know, fighting, bullying, um, but there's, we'll live in a more conflictual society if we can't get allies for 
equal opportunity and all talents being seen. So the stakes are high, but they're different than kind of charging in to break up the conflict. Well, absolutely, and I think it's important, as you mentioned, uh, you know, especially in workplace bullying situations, that having bystanders, allies know, you know, what are the third-party resources they can go to, like the ombuds or the EAP program, um, you know, yes. what are the policies, you know, knowing what that is, talking to the go-worker, because we know in past workplace bullying uh, episodes that we've done that those who are the target tend to really isolate themselves, and so how can the ally be curious, as you say, ask questions, be the learner, you know, uh, and, and really address that early instead of walking away, ignoring it, pretending it didn't happen. Um, so, like you said, depending on the level of risk. So you've given a lot of great strategies already, everything from the, you know, simple ouch, <laughs> you know, to the less is more, as you said, do it early. Uh, even if it's, you know, not perfect, it's clumsy, it's, it's like you said, being that learner and so some really, really great strategies, even just some of that physical strategies. Is there anything um, that you wish I would have asked you about this topic that I haven't that would be important for listeners to know? Well, one thing that I often get asked is, do you need a theory of what's going on to really understand what's going on? Like, do you need to know the theory of unconscious bias to unpack what's happening in that scenario with Jose. And I say no. I mean, that might help. It's always good to be learning um, and to have some of those interpretive tools in our toolkit. Very often you can just sense the awkwardness. You may not even know. Um, there may be some cross-cultural confusions. You may be new in this company, um, but you sense the awkwardness. And, you know, I want to leave the listeners with listen to that sense. When you sense, when you're feeling awkward, probably some other people are too. And that's when it's worth speaking up. Well, I like that you know, analogy of, like you said, cracking open the door because as soon as, as soon as that opportunity is there and they see one person, even if they put the foot through, it'll like, okay, I'm coming with you. So it gives that opportunity uh, for more uh, allies to come together. Now, um, we usually begin to, as we're wrapping up our program and stuff, we usually give an assignment for the week to listeners so they can take that next step. Do you have any recommendations for them? So what I'd like listeners to think about, I try to do this myself, is to pre-commit to being the active bystander. It's amazing how just that pre-commitment makes a difference, makes you more likely to do something. Notice what's going on. If you feel something in the pit of your stomach, pay attention to that signal and act. Intervene. Give it a try. Uh, and talk to others maybe afterwards about how did that go. It doesn't have to be a lonely or scary thing. You can get feedback afterwards, but notice it feel it, and act. Good. Notice it, feel it, and act. Now, you said you do workshops. So where would people, if they said, uh, you know, like, it could be an HR department listening in right now, uh, in, any number of people who are listening to this program and they want to do this bystander training, where would they access you to be able to do that? And do you have any open workshops now? So I do workshops as needed, as I'm invited, I do a lot of this in the classroom at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Mm -hmm. People should feel free to email me if they're interested. I might be able to put them in touch with folks in their area if they're not in the New England area. Um, it's, I don't actually have a web page about workshops, but I'm happy to work with people to design something. I've done things in many different kinds of sectors, different organizations, and it is often with folks in HR or a chief diversity officer who might trigger um, this kind of training to happen. Um, one of the things that's fun about the training is there's a role for everybody with bystander training. So I've had white men come up to me and say, oh, I had a little bit of diversity training burnout. I don't tell racist and sexist jokes, and I don't feel the sting of them as directly as some of my colleagues. So who am I in this workshop? I'm not mm -hmm. really a perpetrator or a victim. But hey, in the bystander workshop, like, there's really something I can do, and I love it, and you know, I have daughters, or I have friends. I'd really love to be an ally. Um, you know, I think it's a kind of a nice refresh as a kind of, of training. So I'm happy to talk to anybody who'd like to design something. Um, I have a number of programs at the ready, uh, but I can always uh, tweak it for what works for your organization. So they can then email you where? So they can email me at 
my name, which is Maureen.Scully at UMB, as in UMass Boston, .edu, or visit the UMB.edu website. Okay, and that's Maureen, M-A-U-R-E-E-N dot S-C-U-L-L-Y at U-M-B, like for Boston, dot E-D-U. Yes, that's right, Patty, yes. Great. Okay, very good. So you have your assignment to pre-commit to be an active bystander, and you said to notice it, feel it, I think you said, and mm -hmm. act on it. Is that right? Yes, that's act. right. Okay, great. Feel it, notice it. I love it. All right, so now, um, all right, so we talked about how they can contact you if they want to engage with you around maybe designing a workshop or coming up your way or connecting them. Uh, are there any other resources that you want listeners to know about regarding this topic? So I will mention one thing that's very powerful. We find that practicing matters, so we often do this through role plays. We might have people take a scenario like Jose's example and play it out going a few different ways with different kinds of bystander responses or moves. I've also done this in partnership with a playback theater troupe. Um, in my area, there's a troupe called True Story Theater, and we've done workshops um, for diversity training where they will – take an example from the audience and through playback theater really get to those issues that you mentioned, Patty, about where's the fear, where's the sense of danger, what is that pit of the mm. stomach feeling, and how do I really work through that and really take a deep dive into understanding what goes on in these moments and whether so hard and so rewarding. So um, we can do the 90-minute version of the workshop or the half-day or longer workshop perhaps involving um, a theater troupe as partners that really helps to bring it to life for people. Oh, that's very interesting. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. And um, I want to thank you so much for being part of our series. We've not talked about bystanders or witnesses before, and so this is a new area. And I'm sure that many, many people, and including myself, have learned uh, so much about, you know, even just kind of break, breaking my own preconceptions and myths about what a bystander is or is not. And so thank you so much for being part of our program series. Great. Thank you, Patty. It's really been fun to discuss with you, and I love your questions. They've made me think, too, so thanks so much. Well, you're welcome. Well, I'm going to give you the final word. So is there any final message that you want to leave with listeners? Go forth and make a difference. Remember, it's the silence of our friends that hurts. Okay. Very good. I love that quote, too. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Patty. Thank you for listening to the Texas Conflict Coach. We hope you've enjoyed the program. You can find over 300 podcasts archived to listen at your own convenience at texasconflictcoach.com or download the podcast at iTunes or Stitcher Radio. To learn about upcoming radio programs and resources, sign up for our monthly e-newsletter.